Nick and Yana Cirilli were out partying on Friday night. She was eager to have a good time and indulged a bit more than usual in her favorite wine. Lana, Yana's closest friend and her husband Steve, hosted the party and decided to kick things off with a game of truth or dare. They convinced five more couples to join, but some of the women were hesitant, especially because Lana could be a bit harsh. The game started calmly enough, with one woman making it clear she wouldn't do anything too wild, like showing her bosom. Others agreed to keep the questions reasonable, but as the game went on and the drinks kicked in, the questions became more daring. One woman suggested that any inappropriate questions could be ignored. Eventually, it was Lana's turn again, and she asked Yana, Truth or dare? Yana chose truth. Who was your best lover? Lana asked. I suppose it's Nick, Yana replied, influenced by the wine she had consumed. With a giggle, Yana added, Just kidding. There was a collective sigh of relief. Lana teased Nick, saying, Well, if you're not number one, you better fight for it. Nick's reaction was a mix of embarrassment and anger evident from his flushed face. Yana quickly realized her mistake and tried to rectify it. She assured everyone she was just teasing Nick and that he truly was her best lover. Nick got up, muttered something about needing a beer, and left the game, not returning. Comments like, oh my god, Yana, and ouch, that's gotta hurt, filled the room. I thought the dumb blonde stereotype was a myth, but damn, you just told your husband he's second best in front of everyone. Is he even second or is it worse? Lana, supposedly Yana's friend, remarked. Yana attempted to get up, saying, I was just kidding, damn it, I'm your friend. Lana suggested they all help calm Nick down. Feeling the urgency to fix things, even in her intoxicated state, Yana knew it wouldn't be easy to soothe her husband. She found Nick near the TV screen, not paying attention to the game. I'm sorry, baby, I was just a little drunk. I thought it was funny, but clearly not. Please, come back to the game. Let me make things right she pleaded. No, just stay away from me. I'm leaving, he replied, standing up to say goodbye to others nearby. Lana approached Yana, asking, where's he going? Home, I need to apologize before he leaves. I messed up big time. I'm really sorry, Lana said about to catch up with Nick. Let him go, please. Right now, he doesn't want to hear anything from any of us, Yana said, tears welling in her eyes. That idiot. Stay here, I'll go find him, Lana offered. No, Lana, don't. You'll only make it worse, Yana pleaded. We joke around all the time. What's his problem? You didn't cheat, so why is he so upset about being second? Lana chimed in, trying to be supportive. But Yana's response wasn't what she expected. Instead of agreement, sadness and shame clouded Yana's expression. Lana immediately caught on. Oh my god, Yana, you did it. Please don't say anything. If Nick thinks anyone else knows my marriage will be over, promise me, Yana, not a word. Not even to Steve, Yana implored. All right, I won't say a thing, but once you're sober, we need to talk, Lana agreed. I need to go home. He probably won't talk to me, but I have to try, Yana murmured quietly as she headed towards the backyard gate. Lana returned, declaring, I'm taking her home to make sure she gets there safely. By the time Lana caught up, Yana had already disappeared through the side door of her house. Yana, Lana called out, but Yana just waved and disappeared inside. Yana immediately went upstairs, changed into a nightgown, and climbed into bed. She reached out to touch Nick's shoulder, hoping for a reassuring kiss. But he remained still, unresponsive. Running her nails down his back, she tried to elicit some reaction, but he stayed motionless. She thought she saw a tear escape from his eye. In a final attempt to ease the tension, she whispered in his ear, Honey, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. I love you. But instead of acceptance, he snapped back, Don't lie to me. I know what you said and what it means. Just go to hell and leave me alone. With that, he got out of bed, stormed into his den, and slammed the door shut. Yana cried herself to sleep. Morning came late, the events of the night keeping her from her usual early start. The kitchen was bare, no coffee brewing, no dishes in sight. It was clear Nick had left in a hurry. Avoiding a face-to-face -face encounter, Yana felt a deep sense of sadness. Her guilt weighed heavily on her, her mind replaying the hurtful truth she blurted out in a moment of drunken candor. Actually, no, she had said loud enough for everyone to hear. Their friends couldn't mistake the implication. It seemed far from a playful tease. She hoped that offering a genuine apology and sincere reassurance would convince her husband that her remark from yesterday didn't matter. Unfortunately, her apology was insincere. She was resolute in keeping this truth, as well as the reasons behind it, hidden from him and everyone else. Desperate to rectify her mistake, Yana decided to send her husband a message, expressing her regrets about the previous night. 
I'm so sorry about last night. With the kids on the way, I felt Lana's party was my last chance to unwind a bit. Admitting I went too far is an understatement. I was so out of it that I thought my behavior was amusing, maybe even playful. I believed I was teasing you, my dear hubby, as any wife would. But the look on your face made it clear I'd made a mistake. Lana chiming in with her own remarks is just her personality. She's unaware of our history and probably meant it in jest. You know she holds you in high regard. Please don't blame her, baby. That's not what I intended. You're the best to me in every way. Forgive me for acting foolishly under the influence, failing to realize how my misguided attempt at humor could hurt you, my beloved. I love you with all my heart. Please come home or at least call me. I love you. With the coffee brewed, Yana sat at the table, holding her head in her hands. She repeatedly questioned aloud why she had said something so foolish. Her phone rang, briefly raising hope that it was Nick, but it turned out to be Lana. Yana initially ignored the call, but Lana called again shortly after, prompting Yana to answer. This conversation was inevitable. Yes, Lana, what's going on? Yana asked. Last night, you started to tell me something and then stopped. It's not like Nick to react that way over an innocent joke, Lana said. No, it's not what you think. Yana replied slowly. I'm coming over, Lana decided. No, that's not a good idea, Yana protested. Just put on the coffee, I'll be there in ten minutes, Lana instructed, not waiting for a response before hanging up. Seven minutes later, Lana walked in through Yana's side door to find a cup of coffee waiting for her on the table, made just the way she liked it. All right, spill it, Lana demanded. Lana, I can't. How long have we been best friends? Haven't I always had your back? Yana pleaded overwhelmed with guilt and needing someone to confide in. First, swear to me you'll never breathe a word of this to anyone, not even Steve, Yana insisted. Yana, I swear I won't tell a soul. This stays between us. Swear on your children's lives. Oh Lord, what have you done, baby? All right, I swear. I swear on my children's lives. I won't breathe a word of this to anyone, Lana vowed, making a solemn promise. This happened five years ago, even before we moved here. The insurance company I worked for had a great year and threw a Christmas party a few days before the 25th. Nick was supposed to attend, but his brother had a small fire at his house, causing chaos. My husband and his truck were called to help. Despite my insistence that I didn't need to go, Nick urged me to enjoy myself with my colleagues while he went to assist his brother. I felt obligated not to miss out since I was the executive overseeing this year's holiday parties, including cleanup and office restoration. Afterward, I prayed that I insisted on helping with the fire damage instead of getting ready for the party. I hesitated. Initially, I wanted to make my husband proud. The skimpy black dress, daring bra, and thong were meant to impress and show off as the hot wife. The outfit choice puzzled me since I didn't consider alternatives. My first mistake was deciding I still wanted attention from other men and wearing a provocative outfit. Even though Nick might be annoyed seeing how I dressed for the party, especially since I was going alone with a co-worker. Got it, Lana exclaimed. Lana quickly caught on, particularly with a co-worker, Yana reiterated. It was all much worse. All right, spill it, girl. Tell me everything from the beginning, every detail, Lana demanded. Okay, damn, I've never said this out loud before. The party was typical. Everyone was merry, drinks were flowing, and some guys were taking advantage of single women under the mistletoe. As the night progressed, I found myself in the company of single girls, which wasn't surprising since my husband wasn't there and I was dressed provocatively. I realized what they were up to and should have put a stop to it, but I was already tipsy and relishing the attention. Two guys in particular, Mark and Jake, kept pushing me to loosen up. They often made suggestive remarks, and to my shame I sometimes responded in kind. Looking back, I understand I was too flirtatious with men at that time, and I regret not considering the consequences sooner. They kept urging me to do things that wouldn't pass my husband's approval. I knew what I was doing, and worse, I convinced myself that a little fun wouldn't hurt. After all, Nick would never find out, right? They led me to places where others couldn't see. The liberties I permitted escalated as the kisses grew more intense, and over time, my morals eroded. Their boldness increased as they realized my symbolic resistance vanished, especially when the likelihood of being caught decreased. Concealed from prying eyes, the men freely groped my body, and I encouraged them, fully aware of it, and worse, they knew it too. It was finally time to send everyone home. As the one in charge, it fell on me to usher them out, albeit after they assisted in cleaning up. With the place looking fairly restored, I switched off the lights and locked the main room, 
before heading to my office to retrieve my belongings, purse, phone, and car keys. However, I hesitated for a moment, realizing I had likely crossed all permissible boundaries. Designated drivers were arranged for everyone except me since Nick was supposed to be mine. The only viable solution for the evening was to call a taxi. Upon opening the door to my office and reaching for the switch, Mark seized my hand, preventing me from turning on the bright overhead light that could signal someone was inside. Let's continue, he said, kissing me on the lips. Initially startled, I began to reciprocate. At that moment, a pair of arms enveloped me from behind, cupping both my bosom, while a firm hardness pressed against my clothed backside. It was Jake. As he began to rub against me, Mark took my face in his hands and kissed me deeply. Clearly intoxicated, their caresses aroused me greatly, and unfortunately thoughts of my husband were far from my mind. I was too lost and consumed to consider the betrayal. Looks like some bad guys want to play, I muttered, stuttering slightly. We were hoping you'd say that, Jake responded, reaching out to switch on the desk lamp for sufficient light without revealing our presence to the outside world. Mark then closed and locked the office door. I need to stress something here, something I doubt anyone, even you, would believe. But I swear to God, it's the absolute truth. When I said I wanted to play, I didn't mean to have lovemaking with them. You're right about that. Convincing anyone, especially Nick, will be near impossible, I explained. Hell, the chances of anyone but me believing it are slim to none, Lana chimed in. I know, I'm fully aware of that, but I need you to believe me. I really, really need you to believe me. All right, baby, I believe you. I've seen firsthand how a little drinks can make someone rationalize things like caviar, Lana reassured. I just thought we'd keep kissing and fooling around while the door was locked. The only thing visible from outside is if the main light is on, so I figured I could have some gentle fun without any risk. I know how foolish it sounds now. Damn, I wish I could turn back time. Lana, I don't know if you've ever had two men try to seduce you, but the intensity of that feeling was overwhelming. Yana paused. Actually, since we're sharing confessions, I have something to add later, but please continue, Lana interjected. Okay, despite my resistance, Mark continued kissing me, and I was so absorbed in him that I forgot about Jake until I heard his zipper. My dress rode up, and Jake almost had my rear exposed. Meanwhile, Mark took advantage of the situation too. That was the moment it dawned on me that these two were going to have their way with me. Well, there was a lot of groping first, but then the clothes started coming off. Yours or theirs? Lana asked, intrigued by her friend's tale. Both, Yana continued. The sensation of two men undressing you while consumed by desire was beyond anything I'd imagined. I weakly protested, saying, No, I can't do this. No, I'm married. But within moments, all I had left was a thong and heels. Being pleasured by two men was the most erotic experience of my life, but what came next surpassed it. They didn't want to stop, and I was in ecstasy. How could anyone compete with such an experience? We were so caught up that it didn't take long until we all reached the peak. It was the best lovemaking I'd ever had. When the intensity waned, thoughts of Nick flooded in, and the magnitude of my betrayal hit me. I pleaded with them to keep our encounter a secret. It was a huge mistake, and I knew my marriage would crumble if the truth emerged. They both promised to stay silent, but I couldn't shake the fear of my betrayal being exposed. Lana sank heavily into a chair. Now it makes sense why you reacted that way yesterday. Did Nick ever find out? Lana inquired. Yana burst into tears before she could respond. If you need a break, it's okay, Lana offered. No, I need to get it out while I still can, Yana insisted and continued. I think they were both shaken by how upset I was, so they sincerely promised to keep my secret. That night I avoided Nick. It was well past midnight when he returned home from helping his brother. The following days were tense. Nick sensed something was amiss, but I denied it until the New Year's party. I wanted to move past it, but I had committed to supervising this year's holiday parties, and I couldn't give Nick any reason to question my reluctance to attend. Jake was conspicuously absent, perhaps out of fear that his wife might suspect something. However, good old Mark was present and heavily intoxicated as usual. With his reputation as a player, I still can't comprehend how I allowed him, of all people, to come near me. Throughout the evening, I attempted to avoid Mark, but as the night progressed and he grew increasingly intoxicated, he became uncomfortably familiar with me. So much so that my secretary, Cindy, pulled me aside and cautioned, Be careful, your husband is here this time. Her emphasis on this time did not escape my notice. 
My God, how many people suspect something? I tried to keep my distance from Mark, but by the end of the night, he seemed determined to flaunt my discomfort in front of my husband. When Nick went to the bar for some drinks, Mark seized the opportunity to approach me, grab my hand, and insisted, Come on, baby, you haven't danced with me yet. Panicked, I emotionally refused. As Nick returned from the bar with our drinks, Mark remarked, You weren't so resistant at the Christmas party. Gripping my hand, attempting to coax me into dancing with him, I recoiled and demanded Mark remove his hands from me. I was terrified, unsure of how much Nick had overheard. An embarrassed expression crossed my husband's face, quickly replaced by anger. In an effort to defuse the situation, I informed Mark that the bar was closing. However, he insisted on another drink. With Cindy nearby, I shot her a pleading look and signaled for her to take my place. Understanding my predicament, she gestured towards my husband and then nodded towards the door. I managed to usher Nick out before any further trouble ensued. I assured my husband that Mark was simply intoxicated, and I was relieved that Nick didn't escalate the situation, as he easily could have. Back at home, Nick inquired, What happened? I attempted to dismiss it, blaming Mark's excessive drinking. However, Nick warned me that if Mark ever approached me again, he would take drastic measures. At breakfast, Nick was still mulling over the events of the previous night and questioned me about what had occurred. Cindy swiftly interjected, asking how she could have handled Mark better than me. Nick then pressed further, questioning why I had behaved strangely at the last party and if I felt guilty about something. He pieced it together, realizing that Mark being drunk couldn't explain his remarks. It was clear he didn't buy the excuse and pressed me once more, this time with greater intensity. Well, what happened at the Christmas party? Feeling dejected, I broke down and confessed that I had gotten drunk and engaged in inappropriate behavior, without delving into specifics. Then Nick looked me straight in the eye and asked, Did you have lovemaking with him? He saw it in my eyes and grasped it even before I answered. There was no point in denying it. So, I admitted that I had consumed too much drinks and felt ashamed that I had allowed it to happen. He was furious, but he didn't press for details, and I refrained from elaborating. Nick left me that day and refused to speak to me. We remained apart for three months, without any communication. It was agonizing for me until he agreed to start conversing with me again. I pleaded with him at every opportunity to take me back, even suggesting an open hall pass to even the score. Eventually, he agreed to counseling. After several months of therapy, I began to sense that Nick was seeking a path to repair our marriage. I was elated that he seemed willing to reconcile, and I was determined to do whatever it took to salvage our relationship. I anticipated that he would inquire for more details, and I was terrified of what revealing the whole truth would do to him. But to my relief, he refrained from asking those questions. I was overjoyed that I didn't have to choose between lying and revealing the truth although I realized that withholding the full story is essentially lying by omission. Ultimately, he agreed to reconcile, pledging to do everything possible to forgive me. However, there were conditions. Firstly, I had to sign a postnuptial agreement stipulating that I would receive minimal assets in the event of another infidelity. Another condition was that I resign from my job and we relocate. Additionally, he surprised me by presenting his own hall passes. Although I had suggested it in my desperation for him to agree without probing further, I signed an agreement granting him a couple of hall passes. I believe he needed them more to rebuild his bruised ego than anything else, as I doubt he ever used them. So I agreed to everything, including moving away from our friends and family, all to win back my husband. Fortunately, he was able to secure a lateral transfer in his company, and my background in insurance facilitated my job search. That's when we moved here. I never had to confess the full truth about my betrayal to him and I remained faithful from then on. I'm sure you understand why. I fear that if he knew everything, he would divorce me. That's why my mistake last night could potentially be disastrous. I must stick to the narrative that it was a tasteless joke, misunderstood only by him, and that he is unequivocally the best thing in my life. Yana paused, letting her narrative sink in. My goodness, did you have a bacchanalia? I fantasized about that. Tell me again, how was it? Lana asked eagerly, reveling in her friend's actions without grasping the peril it posed to the marriage. Damn it, Lana, I nearly lost my husband and I'm still at risk. Then after a significant pause, Yana confessed. It was the most thrilling carnal encounter of my life, she added solemnly. I can never let Nick discover the truth. Never. Okay, I understand why you'd say that. I also get that no man can compete with two. It beats my dirty story, Lana admitted. What did you do? Yana inquired. 
Okay, I need you to swear to me too. This stays between us. Steve would probably kick me out, Lana asserted, locking eyes with Yana. We have a pact. Nothing spoken here will ever be disclosed to anyone else. Yana reciprocated their mutual trust and then urged her friend to divulge. All right, it's your turn to spill everything, Lana initiated her narrative. Both of us. I've never vocalized this before either. We were planning a party with co-workers coming over for a swim and barbecue. That evening, Steve called me with an urgent issue regarding one of their major accounts. He personally managed this client and would be at least three hours late returning home. Ron, Steve's business partner, took it upon himself to step in for Steve and came over under the pretense of assisting me with preparations. He knew their key client had hired Steve and that Steve needed to personally attend to matters at this client's office, which was about an hour and ten minutes away each way. My husband is astute in business dealings, but one thing he lacks is discerning when a friend is deceitful. Man, Ron's a womanizer. He went through a divorce due to infidelity. Being single allows him to pursue his targets without concern for repercussions from a spouse. He had his sights set on me for a while, and I was aware of it. I should have alerted Steve, but I was easily swayed by Ron's flattery. I enjoyed the attention and would reciprocate, sometimes shamelessly when Steve wasn't around. When Ron arrived to help, I was already in a bind. Instead of prepping our backyard, I spent the day lounging by the pool in a tiny bikini, awaiting Steve's return so I could start preparing for our party. I had a couple of margaritas and wasn't intoxicated, but I felt good. I should have gone inside and changed, but I didn't. Ron was clearly enjoying himself, and I relished in letting him watch. We began setting up the patio for our guests. Ron uncovered the grill and positioned it at the center of the patio for easy access. He checked the propane tank's gas levels and briefly lit the grill to ensure it was operational. Then we rearranged some chairs and tables, brought out the beer cooler, stocked the bar, and set up umbrellas. Our guests offered to bring additional holiday appetizers and sides. Once we finished, Ron made us margaritas and suggested we omit mentioning his assistance in preparing for Steve's meeting. We returned to the pool and Ron commented on how he had worked up a sweat and how inviting the pool looked. Noticing he hadn't brought swim trunks, I teased that he could go without them, promising not to peek. Instead of continuing the playful banter, he began undressing. When he was down to just his boxers, he approached me and suggested we swim together, urging me to remove my swimsuit. I should have fled, but my intoxicated and reckless side prevailed. They stripped me undressed, and I impulsively dove into the pool. Ron joined me swiftly, holding me close. We were both unclothed, and I knew I'd let him have coition with me. I surrendered to him, exploring each other's bodies with caresses. It was incredibly wrong, yet undeniably pleasurable. Then Ron began touching me in a way Steve never had, sending me into a frenzy and granting me one of the most intense climaxes I'd ever experienced. The thrill of something new, so wicked and forbidden, transported me to ecstasy. After I calmed down, Ron suggested it was my turn to reciprocate and assist him in a quick finish. I complied and we had a few more drinks. He insisted we not waste time and initiated a third round, possessing me fiercely. I was certain I'd be left with bruises. As he reached his climax, I begged him to stop, and he approached me with a growl. Tears streamed down my face, feeling hurt and ashamed of betraying my husband. That night, I had to conceal my bruises from Steve, pleading with Ron not to disclose our encounter. He warned that if Steve discovered the truth, it would spell trouble for both of us, so we agreed to remain silent. Thankfully, he hasn't attempted to repeat our escapade. I'm relieved and resolved never to cheat again, regardless of the circumstances. However, we still communicate frequently and play golf together a couple of times each month. Since Ron tends to boast, I'm constantly anxious he'll reveal my secret. Steve mentioned that Ron keeps boasting about some wild woman he slept with, but won't divulge her identity. I'm certain he's describing our encounter. The scoundrel is probably relishing in discussing his exploits with his oblivious spouse, if Steve ever learns that Ron is bragging about me, I fear he'll lash out at us both, and perhaps rightfully so. With these words, Lana concluded her harrowing tale. Later that day, Lana phoned Yana. Hey friend, is everything back to normal? No, Lana, I haven't heard a peep from Nick. Five years later, I thought we had moved past it. Have you ever heard about this guy, Mark? Lana inquired. No, but my mom mentioned a co-worker named Mark who got roughed up pretty bad when he left the bar. Do you think it was Nick? I'm not sure. I'm too scared to ask. Plus, I never want to reopen old wounds and cause him more pain. That's why it's so awful that I messed up last night and made him relive it all over again. I'm really worried. 
He won't leave you, honey. He loves you too much. He's just hurt, reliving the fact that you cheated on him. Look, he's already forgiven you for what he knows about. He'll come around. Trust me. I don't know. I'm terrified, Lana. We were planning to have kids. I had my last drink at your party, and then we were going to start trying to conceive. Now I'm not so sure. Are you still planning to get pregnant? That's fantastic, Lana responded enthusiastically. I stopped taking the pills three days ago, but now maybe he's relieved we don't have a child. Who would want to complicate a divorce? Yana replied, tears streaming down her face. Listen, he's probably just passed out drunk in his motel room and will sleep it off. Don't worry, you'll soon be filled with little swimmers. Hey, my grizzly bear is calling. I gotta go. Hang in there. I'll call you tomorrow, okay? Take care of Steve. We'll talk tomorrow. Bye. Both women drifted off to sleep. Yana spent a long, lonely night waiting on the sofa for her husband, who never returned. At three o'clock in the morning, exhaustion finally overcame her, and she fell asleep. Nick rose early on Saturday, packed enough to stay away from home for several days. Unwilling to face his wife, he headed to a diner for breakfast. As he sipped his coffee, he replayed the events of the previous evening in his mind. He seethed. That damn woman, that damn woman. So I'm not her best lover. I guess that idiot Mark really knocked her socks off. Damn woman. He glanced at his phone and powered it off. Let him figure out where I went, he mused. Nick poked at his ham and eggs, pondering his next move. A short-term question arose. What to do for the rest of the day? Then came the inevitable long-term one. Would he ever return home, or should he divorce this woman? Divorce? Lord, is this what it's come to? It doesn't sit right, but making a decision now, when I'm furious, might not be wise. Perhaps I should go back and confront that damn idiot again. No, I was lucky not to get caught last time. I need to think. Maybe hitting the golf course would clear my head. That's it. Everything I need is there already. Maybe there I can figure out what to do about my damn disrespectful wife. He joined another couple, having his own cart, which gave him more time to contemplate since he didn't feel like chatting with his cart companion. After the match, he had a couple of drinks, and the first bright spot of the day was seeing his favorite bartender, affectionately known as Susie Q. Susan Bryant was her real name. They always bantered back and forth, flirting playfully. Despite the flirtation, he never attempted to seduce her. Their suggestive exchanges were merely playful conversations. He assumed she was just trying to boost her tips, which indeed worked. Susie Q immediately sensed that Nick's usual carnal banter was absent and that something was troubling him. When the other golfers left, Nick felt it was the right time and place to continue drinking. Noticing that it wasn't busy, Susie Q approached him. What's wrong, honey? I miss your usual charm, she started. Ah, the usual drama at home, he replied. Come on, darling, you always say that. You can confide in me about anything, sweetheart. That's what I'm here for. Last night, during a game of truth or dare, my wife announced to me and everyone else that I wasn't the best lover she's ever had, he confessed. Damn, is she upset with you or something? I don't believe for a second that's true about you. The way you flirt with me all the time gets me going, she chuckled. I wish you meant that. I need a hot woman to help me relax a bit, he lamented. Do you think I'm hot? She asked, giving him a seductive smile. Hell yes, but I know I'm just a customer and you're doing your job. I get it, I don't stand a chance with you, he replied. She looked him straight in the eyes and said, You do have a chance. This caught Nick off guard. I wish you'd take seriously that you have a chance. A few years ago, my wife messed up. She got drunk and cheated on me with some idiot. After a lot of soul-searching and therapy, I agreed to take her back, but under certain conditions. One of them was for me to have a couple of hall passes to even things out. She gave you free passes to be with other women? Is that for real? Asked Susie. That was the deal. It's even in writing, he confirmed. I'll never tell my husband he's not the best lover. Whether it's true or not, it's just not something you say carelessly, she declared. Nick, I'm off at five. If you want to cash in one of those passes, be here, Susan said, observing more golfers entering the room before leaving Nick to ponder her proposition. As she tended to her new customers, Nick thought to himself, God. I always thought she was just humoring me because I tip well. Maybe she was actually offering me something more. Well, Yana agreed to the passes, and Susie Q might be able to give me what I need to regain my confidence. It was three o'clock in the afternoon, two hours before her shift ended. Nick decided against sitting in a bar, getting drunk, and deliberating on his next move. 
Instead, he dropped two $50 bills on the counter, totaling $58 to settle the tab, waved to Susan, and said, I'll be back. He couldn't shake Susie Q's best attributes from his mind. She possessed eye-catching 36D bosom that drew everyone's attention. Susie Q herself was a stunning woman, several years his senior but didn't look it. To add to her allure, she had a voluptuous and appealing rear. Considering his options, he muttered to himself, Yana never felt the agony of betrayal, the unbearable pain I had to endure. Perhaps she wouldn't be so promiscuous if she had experienced what I did, to hell with it. I'm going to shower, change, and return to the bar at 5 to see if Susie Q is serious or not. At 4.45 p.m., Nick returned to the bar, and Susie couldn't help but smile broadly. She poured him a whiskey and cola, placing it in front of him and remarked, After that last tip, this one's on me. She added, Bill's here to take over the bar. Just give us a moment to close out the register and I'll be ready to go. I'm famished. Any ideas on where we'll dine? As she prepared to leave, Nick phoned and reserved a table at one of the city's finest restaurants. During dinner, he attempted to steer the conversation towards Susie, but she sought a more thorough explanation of why he chose to ask her out. He divulged everything he knew. She revealed only that she was divorced, had been a flirtatious wife, and that this contributed to the demise of her marriage. After dinner, they ventured to a dance club, imbibed a few drinks, and danced. During the third dance, with her holding him tightly, she proposed, Listen, I understand you're trying to be a gentleman, not rushing straight into bed, but I've made my intentions clear. How about we leave here together? Without further debate, the bill was settled, and they headed to her apartment. Care for a drink while I slip into something more comfortable? She inquired. Nick simply smiled and accepted her offer. As she disappeared into the bedroom, his breath caught in his throat. He managed to utter, My God, you're stunning. She emerged wearing a Steelers jersey and nothing else. She reached up, placing her hands on the back of his head, drawing him into a passionate kiss. I'm glad you approve, she murmured as she guided his hand to her most carnal area. Susie led him toward the bed, kissing him fervently and disrobing him along the way. Would you consider staying the night? We'll need some extra time as I hope you'll explore every carnal possibility, she purred seductively, reclining on the bed. They passionately caressed and stimulated each other. He had never encountered a woman who derived such pleasure from pleasuring a man. They reached climax simultaneously. Did you enjoy yourself? She inquired. It was incredible. Truly amazing, he replied, struggling to find the right words to encapsulate the experience. I'm thrilled you had a good time, but the same rule applies to guys. He appeared embarrassed, so she added, Promise me never tell your woman she's not the best. Understanding dawned on him, and he chuckled. Got it. Lie down, I'll grab us some glasses. We'll regroup, then I'll sort you out again, she instructed. Her flawless bare backside swayed enticingly as she returned to the kitchen. Nick couldn't help but be mesmerized by her seductive movements. After allowing him time to recover, Susie began gently massaging his entire body. This round lasted a bit longer, which suited them both just fine. They reached their climax once more. Did you ever imagine we'd end up here? She inquired. No, never. Well, maybe I fantasized about it a couple of times while Jana and I were carnal, but it felt a bit awkward. Usually, after a day on the field and some playful banter, I'd be in the shower at home thinking about this, he confessed, nodding toward her impressive bosom. Susie giggled, then added, I never thought it'd actually happen either. I fantasized too, imagining how you'd make me feel in reality. It's so much better, isn't it? Yes, much better. Please stay with me today. I know this is probably a one-time thing, so let's make it special. It's been a while since I woke up next to a man, she requested. Nick nodded and Susie Q grinned. After recharging sufficiently, she said, I hope you're ready for the final round. No further encouragement was needed. The next morning, Nick awoke to the aroma of bacon. Susie Q had already prepared coffee and breakfast as he strolled into the kitchen, fully dressed. Is all this necessary? He questioned. It's okay. I wanted to go all out, she reassured him with a smile. Susan, he began, don't apologize. I know you still love your wife. I'm mature enough to understand. I wanted you just as much as you wanted me last night, she interjected, cutting off his apology. Besides, she continued, I'm not cut out for monogamous relationships, which is actually why I got divorced. I thought it was your husband, that he was the biggest fool alive. He was basically an idiot and had issues with being faithful. But he had his moments. We mutually decided we didn't want to be married. But that's not your style, is it? 
she asserted more than asked. No, it's not. Look, I need to head home and have a serious talk with my wife. I'm fine, really. I thoroughly enjoyed last night, he assured her. Finish the breakfast I made for you. From now on, we'll just be naughty friends again, teasing each other at the club, Susan declared. After finishing his meal, Nick stood up, pulled her close, and kissed her passionately, reigniting her arousal. I'm off, he said as he headed toward the door. If you ever need another hall pass, cash it in with me, she added. You'll be my first choice, he replied with a wave goodbye. Sunday morning, Yana, feeling sleepy and deprived of sleep, was awakened by Lana's call. Hey there, any word from Nick? No, Yana, sorry. We haven't heard anything either. Steve's starting to ask questions. He thinks Nick's reaction was too intense for just some teasing. You didn't mention it, did you? Please tell me you didn't, Yana pleaded. No, I promised. Don't worry, I won't breathe a word. It's probably just a hangover. Try not to stress too much, Lana reassured her. Easier said than done. Did he pack clothes or a shaving kit? He grabbed some stuff, toothbrush, razor, Yana replied. What about his suits? He usually wears them to work, right? I think they're all in the closet, Yana said. He's got work tomorrow, right? He'll be back today, I'm sure. When he does, shower him with love, Lana advised. But what if he doesn't return or says it's over? Yana let her worst fears surface. That doesn't make sense. He's not going to end things now after forgiving you. He'll cool off and come home. You might have to swallow some pride, but do what it takes, Lana encouraged. I just want him back so I can show him how much I love him. I think he's pulling in. Gotta go, Yana said, ending the call. When Nick arrived, Yana was already seated at the kitchen table. We need to talk, he said, causing Yana to gasp, half expecting him to end things. You tore my heart out. All those awful images of you with that guy came flooding back. To hear I wasn't your best lover. It felt like your date was more than just a joke, he started. Yana seized the moment, repeating most of what she'd said in her Saturday morning message, hoping to sway him back home. Baby, that's not what I meant. I was drunk, thought I was joking, playing a prank. I wasn't thinking about the past. I was just teasing, like any wife would. Nobody, I mean nobody, thought I was serious. Even Lana's comment was just in jest. She's been calling, apologizing, feeling awful, blaming herself for our problems, she explained. I don't know, it felt like more than just a joke. And I don't want Lana dragged into this. This is between us. Please tell me you didn't tell her anything else, Nick pressed, fearing Yana might spill the beans. No, baby, I didn't. Just between us, she assured, adding another layer to the lie. I swear, that's not what I meant. You're everything to me. Let me make it right, Yana pleaded. Okay, okay, let's say I believe you. But there's something else. On Saturday, I went to the club. When those memories came back, I was furious. I started to resent you for what happened. Even after five years, it still hurts, Nick confessed, leaving Yana frozen, uncertain of what came next. Afterward, I lingered at the bar, hoping to drown my sorrows. The guys I was with finished their drinks and left. Susie, the bartender, noticed my downcast mood. Since we'd always been friendly, she came over and asked what was wrong. I was already quite drunk, so I spilled about last night and how you didn't think I was the best. Susie offered if I wanted to cash in one of my passes, she'd be off at five. I went back to the course, playing a few more holes, trying to figure out if I wanted to use her to get back at you. I was also considering a divorce. When Nick mentioned divorce, Yana took a deep breath. Not wanting to delay, he continued, I realized ending us wasn't exactly what I wanted, but I needed to alleviate the pain you caused. It may seem petty, but I wanted you to feel the same hurt. Just before the end of the workday, I returned to the bar. Susie understood without a word. Yana was speechless. The gravity of her husband's confession sank in, tears streaming down her cheeks as he went on. We quickly made plans for the evening, including dinner and dancing. Then I spent the night with her. Nick felt ashamed. The free pass he used wasn't free at all. He wanted Yana to suffer, and he succeeded. But the emotional toll on both of them was high. Oh my God! Yana exclaimed, rushing to the bedroom and locking the door. Nick believed trying to talk with her now would be fruitless, so he went to the utility room for his work clothes. After changing, he went outside, started the lawnmower, and began working on the lawn, wanting to prolong his time away. He also mowed their elderly neighbor's yard, a task he often did. While washing his truck, he noticed her car was gone. He figured she must have left while he was mowing the neighbor's grass. Soon after, Yana returned, parked the car, and emerged with a small bag. 
Spotting her husband, she didn't approach him, but headed inside instead. He assumed she might have dashed off to the store after completing her tasks. It was five in the evening, and Nick finally conceded that he had run out of excuses to delay going back inside. Yana was in the kitchen, seemingly preparing dinner, her eyes betraying hours of tears. Did you go to the store? I saw you with the bag, Nick inquired. No, just some things from the pharmacy that I left in the car yesterday while I was out searching for you. Where were you? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, he persisted. I went to your golf club. I wanted to talk to her. Susan? Why? I asked her not to take you away from me, Yana confessed. Yana, that's not going to happen, Susan reassured her. Then she confessed she wasn't keen on being exclusive herself. She also mentioned she was certain you were in love with me. I love you. Nick affirmed. That's not the issue, he added. She also asked if I truly said you weren't my best ever in front of our friends. When I nodded, she questioned whether I was in my right mind to say something like that or just being foolish. I told her I meant it as a joke. She said there's nothing funny about that, especially in front of friends. Damn, are you ready for her advice? When I said yes, she shared a couple of insights. What were they? Nick inquired. I can't disclose it, it's a secret pact among women, Yana replied, a smile finally breaking across her face. After the truth or dare fiasco, Susan shared that a woman should always uplift a man's ego, particularly in public. Tell him and others, too, that he's the strongest, the most handsome, the smartest, and tops the list. The best lover in the world. Just like you love to hear that you're the smartest, most beautiful, hottest, most loving wife there is. It doesn't have to be entirely true. It's his belief that you see him that way that matters. He wants to be your hero. Let him. Yes, and one more thing. Look at him with adoration in your eyes. I'm just saying, don't let him know our secret, or it will only make things worse. Baby, I'm at a loss for words, Nick began, attempting to steer the conversation back to civility before anything else was said. Answer me. Do you still want to stay married? I love you and I'm certain I want us to remain together but Friday shattered me nearly as much as it did five years ago. My ego needed a boost, and fueled by drinks on Saturday, my wounded pride led me to exploit the promise you made when we agreed to stay married. I understand what I promised. Five years have gone by, and I thought we no longer needed to settle the score. Baby, I... He started, but Yana cut in. No, don't apologize. I made this agreement. I just didn't anticipate how much it would hurt if you chose to act on it. Nikki... I'm so sorry for causing you this unbearable, enduring pain. I feel awful imagining you in her bed, doing to her what should only be done with me. This mess we're in is my fault. I have to own up to it. I'll accept the consequences of my mistake. I just want to remain your wife. Instead of a verbal response, Nick opened his arms and Yana rushed into them, embracing him desperately. Nikki, are we okay now? I agreed to a few hall passes, but I don't think I can handle it. If you're going to continue with this bartender, only you know the answer for sure, since I never asked for details about when it happened. I was too devastated to ask at the time, even during our counseling sessions. I didn't inquire if there was more. I suppose I didn't want to know if it was worse than what I already knew, the thing I was going to divorce you over. I wanted your actions to be a forgivable mistake. Was there more to it than I already know? Yana gasped, struggling to maintain composure and avoid breaking down. She mentally weighed each possible answer and its potential consequences. What? Is there more? What haven't you told me? Nick asked, his tone irritated yet tinged with fear. The moment of truth has arrived. Yana confessed to her drinks-induced, lust-driven bacchanalia, which provided her with the most fulfilling carnal experience of her life, that she cheated with two men, not just one. She was certain that revealing this fact would likely lead to losing her husband, or she must summon every ounce of strength look him squarely in the eye, and lie convincingly. Yana had been pondering how to answer this direct question for five years. She reasoned that disclosing everything would inflict even greater pain on Nick, and likely end their marriage. Neither option was acceptable to her. She concluded that this would be her burden to bear, a sacrifice she must make to salvage her marriage and shield it from unnecessary agony. Though initially taken aback, her response came promptly and didn't seem fabricated. He had no clue she'd been preparing for this moment for so long. She lied as if her life depended on it. No, my love. I gave that idiot access to my body once. Let's call it even. We both need to let this go or it will destroy our marriage. If you can truly forgive me and let go of my past mistake, I won't breathe a word about your encounter with Susan. 
I need this to be over. Do we understand each other? She pleaded with her eyes. Yes, I need it to end too. What we did to each other caused immense pain. I agree that if we keep dwelling on it, we won't survive. I don't need passes anymore, he said. I love you, he continued. I love you more than you realize. I'll never again make you doubt that you're my best at everything, she replied. Both of them set aside the events of the previous weekend and those from five years ago. There will never again be a reason to dredge up a malignant past. In the days following their reconciliation, best friends Yana and Lana continued to confide in each other. They both agreed they needed to bury the truth of the past for their marriages to thrive. They pledged to never speak of their past indiscretions or their consequences again. An unexpected outcome of Yana and Nick's conflict was that Lana woke up to the dangerous path she was on, and it scared her. She intentionally changed her interactions with other men. Steve noticed the change in Lana's behavior and questioned her about it. She explained that she realized she had been taking him for granted and was determined to fix their relationship. Steve also noticed an increase in the frequency and intensity of their carnal encounters. Was Susie Q's wise advice passed on to Lana? Three months after their reconciliation, Yana's birth control failed, and she became pregnant. Nick was overjoyed. Their new chapter as a loving family began without looking back. A year after the truth or dare incident, Ron got blackout drunk while golfing with Steve and revealed his affair with Lana. Steve's reaction was immediate. He punched Ron, knocking him to the ground. Ron's golf bag was thrown off the cart, leaving him on the 16th tee. Returning home, Steve confronted Lana, who immediately confessed and begged for forgiveness. Steve moved out for several months, weighing his options. Ron and Lana had agreed that it would be detrimental if Steve found out about the affair. Ron accepted a settlement from Steve, regretting his actions. Lana's ordeal scared Yana, but Lana managed to survive the divorce and start anew as a single mother. Years later, Lana met a man she had previously encountered at a work convention. They started dating, got married, and relocated to his home state. The once close friendship between Yana and Lana suffered due to deceit, now reduced to occasional Christmas cards and random phone calls. Only four people knew the truth about Yana's indiscretion. The only one who could threaten Nick and Yana's marriage was Yana herself, and she vowed never to do so.